The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, Eric back with you. Today's podcast is going to be thought-provoking. It's going to be potentially controversial. It's definitely going to make you think about how we perform airway management and how we make decisions in regards to resuscitation. When this topic was initially presented to me, I was a little uncomfortable. Thought it would be best to have this discussion with three different physicians. So we brought together Dr. Mike Loria, our Chief Medical Director, our Associate Medical Director, Jeff Jarvis, and an anesthesiologist out of UT Health in Texas, Christopher Stevens. Join these three men as they discuss this hot topic. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Flight Bridge Ed MD Cast. My name is Mike Laurie. I'm your host. I am an emergency medicine, EMS, and critical care physician uh, with a passion for how we manage uh, pre hospitally and transport super sick patients. And today, our super sick patient series continues uh, talking about um, critically ill patients, specifically physiologically uh, difficult airway management and crash airway management. I am joined uh, by two amazing guests today. One gentleman who needs no introduction, the uh, illustrious Jeff Jarvis, who you all know from the uh, EMS Lighthouse Project uh, and many other EMS venues. And we are joined by a uh, first-timer to our podcast, uh, Dr. Chris Stevens, who has uh, an amazing EMS resume, a rare bird in the pre-hospital and transport world, one of our anesthesia colleagues who's actually done uh, EMS fellowship, uh, and a, a very impressive resume. I'll let Chris introduce himself. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks, Mike, and I appreciate the introduction. My name is Chris Stevens. I started out as an EMT and a paramedic here in Texas uh, after my undergrad and uh, went on to uh, work for a few years in the field before starting medical school at University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, following my schooling and residency there in Galveston, I moved up to Baltimore, Maryland, did my trauma fellowship at Maryland Shock Trauma. Uh, and stayed on faculty and staff there for a number of years before moving back to Houston to join the faculty at McGovern Medical School here at UT Health Houston. Um, I did my EMS fellowship here at UT Health a few years ago, and I'm medical director of two local fire departments here in the Houston area. So proud to be on here and uh, look forward to contributing. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. I love it when we have people from all sorts of different backgrounds and different clinical specialties, ICU, emergency medicine, pre-hospital, anesthesia. It uh, it makes for a great, great conversation. And full disclosure, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're, you're, you're basically uh, enjoying a podcast right now with three recovering paramedics. So all of us have worked pre-hospitally and have uh, gone on to uh, gone on to medical school and beyond. So, uh, forgive us if we uh, get off course and uh, uh, and just uh, get into our uh, our love of EMS here. But anyway, moving right along. Today we are going to talk about um, critically ill patients in airway management in the pre-hospital setting, specifically um, medication assisted or drug assisted airway management. Which drugs we use, how we manage airways, uh, and I will say this is a big disclaimer right up front. We're going to talk about some very controversial issues. Uh, we're going to talk about some evidence. We're going to talk about some science. We're going to talk about some clinical practice, and like I said, some very controversial stuff. So please, please, please um, keep an open mind. Keep it professional and think through some of these things um, because some um, some ideas coming in that are actually quite sound uh, should be considered even though they're, they may not be considered the standard of care in certain venues or common practice in certain places. So keep an open mind. Um, getting right into it. Let's just start hey, out Mike. by talking. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. So, Mike, I'm going to have to interrupt you right there, man. You didn't tell me that we were going to have to be professional. I don't know if I can rise to that challenge. <laughs> well, I guess you're going to have to give it your best shot, my friend. That's right. <laughs> All right. 
So let's start out with a very interesting topic, and that is this idea of awareness, sedation, and uh, and hemodynamics as it relates to uh, medication or, or drug-assisted airway management. And it's always a balance, right? Um, we are trying to perfuse the ba- brain, but we want to make sure that they don't remember uh, some of these events because um, they can be pretty unpleasant. And we do know that there is a connection between recall of some of these things, a sense of uh, of being specifically paralyzed uh, while awake and feeling or having the sensation of something dangerous is going to happen to you, loss of control, and not being able to move when you're paralyzed. And that's not good, right? But it's also not good to, you know, not have any blood flowing to your brain uh, or cardiovascular collapse, both of which I think we can all agree are pretty bad and both of which are pretty well documented. Um, so adverse events during emergency endotracheal intubation in the emergency department and ICU are, are, are reported to be relatively high in some studies, up to about 45%. And the stuff we're really worried about, in particular, things like cardiac arrest, is somewhere in the range of 2 3% um, if you survey the literature, which is not insignificant when you consider um, emergency airway management and uh, and how often that we do it. Um, there does seem to be a pretty strong association with uh, shock index in some studies and low blood pressure in terms of um, in terms of that incidence of cardiac arrest. Those seem to be associated. Um, but at the same time, we have some trials, including the ED AWARE trial, that show that uh, awareness with paralysis is, at least in the emergency department, not um, completely uncommon. Uh, it's around 2.6%, I believe, in, in that particular uh, in that particular trial. Now, let yeah, me Mike, start uh, out by asking... Oh, go for it, Jeff. Well, I'm glad you brought up ED AWARE um, because they also, they didn't just talk about the incidence of, or prevalence, I always get those two confused, um, about the rate of ED awareness. They also talked about the consequences of it. Um, And being aware when uh, paralyzed increases your odds of PTSD. Um, It increases your odds of depression. And these are these can be lifelong events. So it's not inconsequential either. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Agree. And I think um, one a couple interesting things on that that I like to throw out first. Let me start out by asking Chris, what are you know, if you were to look at the the anesthesia literature in general or in your experience, the the rates of people who are going undergoing routine anesthesia, um, waking up or having any semblance of awareness. Are you familiar with how that stands in comparison? Uh, Yes. Um, In general, across the the board for your typical elective case um, or, you know, semi-urgent case, let's say for a patient going to the operating room and undergoing general anesthetic, um, it's it's certainly much less uh, than the reported literature in the emergency departments across the country. And I think there's probably, you know, many reasons for that. But, um, you know, I think it's somewhere in the order of probably less than or just under probably one, I'd say way less than one percent. And I think the reason is, is because most of those cases that are reported in the literature are elective type cases, um, maybe some urgent cases, but certainly not a lot of emergency cases where we're RSIing emergency uh, general surgery cases, trauma cases, um, you know, crash, obstetric, you know, C-sections, things of that nature. Uh, so that's why I think we see a much lower um, incidence of this in the, in the general anesthesia world. Um, it does happen, but again, it, you would almost have to try and make it happen on an elective procedure where you walk out, have a cup of coffee and ignore the patient, you know, for a little while. Um, you know, patients ask us sometimes, so I've seen this movies about being awake under surgery and that sort of thing. It does happen in other countries outside the United States. Um, it has happened here, um, you know, occasionally, but again, those are under certain circumstances that are very unique and very uncommon. Um, fortunately, anesthesia is very safe now, and we yeah. rarely get a recall. And when we do get a recall, guess what it's for? It's when they're waking up out of anesthesia at the end of the procedure. They hear us talking to them. They feel us touching them. They hear voices. They may hear music, whatever. And that's the awareness of the senses coming back as they wake up and we get ready to extubate them. So we have to clarify a lot of times when pe- people have awareness what exactly they do remember. And then we can usually pin it down as, a, you know, that's usually during the emergence phase. 
Yeah. You know, I one of one the of things that... that I'd like to echo about what Chris said is when you're mm-hmm. talking about airway management, one of the key things that you really have to define before you can understand the point that the speaker is making is what is the context for whatever they're saying. So what is the population that you're studying and how was that population selected? So the, um, I would agree. I'm not familiar with the literature of awareness in uh, general anesthesia because I don't, that's pretty boring paper to say zero over a huge number. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a never happen event, right? It is something that, um, our anesthesia colleagues go to great lengths to make sure does not happen. And if it's at risk of happening, then you can postpone the case, uh, until you can select your population to make sure it doesn't happen, which is absolutely the right thing to do. A different population, the emergency population, where whatever reason you have to take their airway, that's not necessarily an option. So the population is different. Um, I would still argue that 2.6%, regardless of the population, is unacceptably high. Um, And we need to recognize that it is a challenge and mitigate that challenge uh, in any way we can. I'm interested to hear your thoughts, gentlemen, on two things. First, I really want to touch on this idea of a never event. Um, It's been turned that way in the literature, but I think it's interesting because we say this should never, ever happen, right? And I I do acknowledge that it shouldn't, and we should take all Mm -hmm. courses to avoid it. However, um, we accept a misrate of, for example, ACS of what, Jeff, uh, remind me, 1%, 2%, we consider something like that acceptable because actually we might be doing more harm than good by doing workup to increase the sensitivity such that we get everybody, 100%, a zero miss rate. So what do you think about when we define metrics like that compared to um, this idea of a a never event uh, patients being aware? I think the idea of a never event is aspirational. I think it's an aspirational measure when we talk about things as never events. I don't think anybody actually believes it's never going to happen. Plane crashes are never events, yet we know that they still happen. Um, So I think it's more of an aspirational measure. Gotcha. The other thing is, and I think we have to suss this out, and Chris brought this up and you echoed it, right? Um, When people are experiencing awareness, right? And one of the questions that I had when I first read the ED Aware paper, and they did, by the way, my compliments to uh, to that team, my compliments to um, the, the team at Hennepin that's published a bunch of really interesting airway papers recently. Um, but the, the, one of the things they did was they documented and went through, was it an awareness around paralysis, before paralysis, right? And they actually did a really great job of um, uh, of uh, kind of sussing that out. And I think the 10 patients that actually experienced uh, some sort of awareness, and not all of them were around the time of intubation. Um, I, I want to say, and please don't quote me on this, it was like four or five, it was like half of them, so even less than 10, um, actually had some remembrance of the intubation event itself. More were about half or maybe a little bit more than half were afterward, which kind of makes sense to me like in a busy ED flow, right? They get a medication, they go to sleep, the, they're still paralyzed for whatever reason, and we don't get the sedation on early enough. We get distracted or busy because there's five traumas that came in one time and we don't uh, adequately sedate them or provide at least some sort of amnesia. What do you think about that? Well, I think you're exactly right. And I, you forced me to pull up um, uh, Ryan's paper here. So I, I have it open in front of me. And I think the key thing they were trying to get at with defining when the awareness happened is their finding about the exposure to rocuronium. So clearly, it's not rocuronium that's waking you up from <laughs> from your induced coma by any means. It's that your rocuronium is a longer lasting uh, paralytic. And exactly what you said, Mike, it can outlast the initial sedation. And that's the reason your odds ratio for being aware with your rocuronium versus sucks, which was essentially the only other paralytic used for this purpose, um, is five. So a five-fold increase. Uh, 
in the awareness if you use rock and there's nothing special about rock you just have to make sure that you don't for, you don't forget this you it go through lots of things to make sure that you're not overlooking that step yeah absolutely and so it could be in fact related to the medication um and in fact it was in in that trial right the other thing i think that was interesting um in driver's most recent in, in brian's most recent paper the hennepin group that most recent paper where they actually suggested they they did a deeper dive into more patients they suggested there was a slight even a slightly higher uh rate of awareness in the seven percent range um which I, th- I thought was very interesting um I'm not 100% sure based on looking at some of those cases that it might be that high, um, but I don't have enough, I don't have sufficient data to refute it necessarily. One of the things I think was interesting, and this will lead us into the next part of our case discussion, so I think it's a, it's a great segue, is there was an association between if you came in with a decreased level of consciousness, I want to say they, they define it as like a GCS less than five, um, and not remembering anything, which kind of makes sense. Like you come with a bad enough head injury, or you kind of come in completely unresponsive, and your brain's not being perfused, probably not transitioning things into long term memory or aware of what's going on around you. So I thought that was interesting, and uh, and I think that that I, I really want to use that as a segue to talk about sedative agents, uh, neuromuscular blockade, and hemodynamics. So um, the effect of sedative uh, agents on hemodynamics. Chris, I wanted to start out with you on this one. I mean, um, there, there are lots of sedative agents that we use all the time, but I mean, things like uh, Atomidate and, and ketamine, I mean, they, they have to be completely, perfectly safe, absolutely hemodynamically neutral, right? I mean, they ha- can't have any effect on your blood pressure, can they? Yeah, of course not. No, no, <laughs> never. Not if used the right way, right? <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, that's unfortunately one of the things, you know, we've seen both on the EM side of the house as well as the anesthesia side of the house over the years when I was certainly when I was a resident and a fellow at shock trauma, um, you know, I, I gained very, uh, you know, much respect for sedative hypnotic agents and just how potent they actually are in the elderly and in very sick shocked patients that are either like septic shock, um, hemorrhagic shock, um, you know, you name it, but the, these drugs are extremely potent in the critically ill and injured population. And one of the reasons we've started looking at getting away from weight based dosing of these sedatives when it comes to airway management um, is that we, we, I just, we, we've seen that we're way overdosing the majority of these patients, that they don't really need the textbook amount of drug in order to induce a hypnotic state uh, and have amnestic effects, right, from the innovation procedure and thereafter. So um, absolutely, we, we've, I think we've done a disservice a little bit to, to both medicine and the EMS community with uh, the way we've rolled out RSI, the way we've rolled out sedative hypnotics for these very sick patients. And in the elderly, you have a septic old person, you're, you've you really got to look at how you're dosing some of these powerful sedatives. So and, I'm, you, I'm know, you brought up the normal weight-based dosing. What is the... Um, mm-hmm. What is the uh, that that dosing based off of? We talked about populations um, earlier and how we study them. Who uh, was studied when we came up with those uh, dosing ranges? Yeah, they did dose response curves, you know, for generations ago. I mean, gosh, it's been a long time, especially in the anesthesia world and our you know classic textbooks, pharmacology textbooks. You know, the the dose response curves of these sedative hypnotics have been known for a long time and. The problem is, again, we're comparing apples and oranges, a lot of these studies, you know, you're looking at healthy volunteers uh, with no comorbidities, um, you know, that are paid to come in and do a lot of these clinical studies of looking at drug dosing. Uh, and it's, it's very challenging to translate that to the, you know, sick and ill, you know, the, the sick population that we have to deal with day in and day out. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these weight based regimens, which work fantastic, by the way, in pediatric populations. So that's a whole different conversation. You know, I'm going to stick with adults uh, in this topic. Um, but, you know, I've found out a long time ago and I've, I've lived it. I've studied it. I've, 
talk to my colleagues about it, that weight-based dosing on some of these drugs in the adult population, it, it can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. Now, there was uh, an interesting paper that I'd like to talk about recently. I think, Jeff, you did a, a fantastic uh, EMS Lighthouse uh, uh, episode on it. Um, but before, before I touch on that, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get, I wanted to hop on that point that, that Chris said, because there's a very interesting body of literature, basic science literature, uh, bench research literature going back to World War II, um, that looked at changes in serum and even CNS concentrations of a lot of these medications. I don't think atomidate, I couldn't find one specifically with atomidate, but a lot of these medications um, actually increases substantially in someone with a low cardiac output or hemodynamically compromised. I mean, that's for a number of reasons. And I think that's really, really interesting. And my clinical practice has... Uh, from the time I was in the military through being a flight paramedic through now seems to, um, seems to reflect that recently. There was a very interesting paper uh, that was published by Brian driver and his colleagues about the uh, dose of ketamine or atomidate and its effect on hypotension. Uh, and Jeff, since you did the episode on it, would you mind, um, talking about that uh, real quickly or, or summarizing their findings. No, it's hard to do in like one or two sentences here. <laughs> you bet. No, I just think it's cute that you think I remember what I say on podcast. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, I actually have a question for Chris as a follow-up. And this is a, this is not me being argumentative. This is actually truly a, a question that I have. Um, and this will also allow me to stall a little bit to be able to better answer Mike's question as I dramatically, <laughs> rapidly pull up Brian's paper and try to remind myself what it was. Um, so there is, I noticed the way you said that about reducing the dose of sedative hypnotics. And I'm assuming you're including ketamine in that broad category. There. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, we can um, talk about the reasons for that too. Yeah, what I'm interested in um, is the way you said it is they need substantially less. And that certainly has been, uh, that's matched my experience also with profoundly sick people. It looks like when I start with lower doses, I get the desired effect at lower doses. Um, but I think a, a way a lot of this has been spun on social media and other places is that you have to lower it because badness happens, um, whatever the badness is. And because I, I like to be a literature based guy, it's not that I don't believe that. And I, it certainly anecdotally seems to me that I see an association between dose and post intubation hypotension. But I haven't been able to prove it, and I'm looking for literature on it to try to understand this. Um, is there great literature on um, – and I, I will get to driver's paper, which doesn't support that. Is there other literature saying if you give your normal 2 milligram or 1 milligram per kilogram dose of ketamine or 0.3 per kilo of Atomidate that you get more hypotension? I think it's some of the not probably not not been seen much in respect to pre-hospital emergency medicine uh, patient populations, but I know that there has been some anesthesia literature that has alluded to this is with certain patient populations. Um, uh, you know, frail patients. I, you know, we do fragility patients in orthopedics a lot, and uh, you know, septic patients, things of that nature. Uh, where there has been some literature that's delved into that. They have never done a deep dive, to my knowledge, though, on more of the patients that, that we're used to taking to, uh, care of in the trauma center and the pre-hospital environment. And that's something that I hope we can shed some light on that in the near future. That's something I'm interested in looking more into and trying to publish some data here at Houston, um, just based on seeing this day in and day out for a living in the operating rooms of a busy trauma center. Um, the ICUs is another great place. We go up to reinnovate patient ICUs, and that's a whole nother uh, chain of events that we see when we overdose. And it's very commonly seen there because propofol is used, which we don't use in the field, obviously. But again, very potent drug that we use in anesthesia. But even with ketamine and atomidate, um, we do see a, a, a drop in blood pressure pretty readily in these sick, under resuscitated patients. I, I do think fantastic it's an interesting point, question. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to see some data on it. Um, I, I'm it, with you. I would too. 
it because as I've heard, and obviously Scott Weingart has been preaching this a lot to EM circles, and I I get it, but it's coming across as this is the opinion that we should do this. And I mean, it makes sense to me, but I like to know when I'm practicing opinion-based medicine and when I'm practicing evidence-based medicine. And it, I, God knows, like every physician, I practice my fair share of opinion-based medicine. You, you do it. It happens. Um, I just like to know which one I'm talking about. So to to Mike's point, the paper we're talking about um, was by the Hennepin Group. It's Brian Driver and Stacy Trent, and then Calvin Brown, who's the principal investigator for the NEAR Registry, the National Emergency Airway Registry uh, Project. This is a group that collects prospective data on every intubation done in the emergency department, or at least they try to get everyone done in academic teaching hospitals. So again, when we talk about studies, we got to talk about selection bias. These are academic EDs. And the title of the paper is Sedative Dose for RSI and Post-Intubation Hypotension. Is there an association? So this was a study of that registries, right? So it's not a trial. This is just going back and looking for association. They looked at patients who got ketamine or Atomidate, and they bro- uh, broke those patients in, into two groups and just wanted to say one group is those who had post-intubation hypotension. The other is the ones who did not. And they were looking for an association between the dose and the presence of hypotension. And ultimately, they did not find one. Their confidence interval crossed Uh, the point of no difference, and they weren't able to find it. Um, Again, just to, they say this in the the follow-up in their discussion, Um, I like to say it doesn't mean there's not one, it means they didn't show one. Uh, Those are two different concepts. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, um, first of all, congratulations to them for for doing this. I thought this was a very well-wrought study there. Uh, the the additional analyses, which we won't get into, listen to Jeff's podcast for to read the paper, uh, are, are are pretty impressive. I did have a couple of uh, thoughts, and and some of which they they mentioned in their limitations, um, which is uh, obviously it's a registry. Uh, database uh, problems with that. In particular, one of the practical things I think about anytime you're at an academic center, um, there are different ways to record that data, right? So there's the Hennepin way, which is, as I recall, and if someone's out there from Hennepin, please feel free to correct me. They actually have people doing all the recording. Um, and a, a third party per, uh, person, uh, research uh, assistant that's recording everything. Uh, at other shops, I won't name names, uh, the way that the data gets entered into the NEARS registry is, uh, you know, uh, someone named uh, Michael Moria, uh, who may uh, appear to be somewhat like myself, uh, yelling at the nurse, hey, what was that blood pressure? Oh, yeah, okay. And that's what goes in the charting. Or me trying to catch up at the end of a busy shift after seeing 20 patients in recess being like, I think his blood pressure was this. Yeah. And it wasn't until some of my colleagues pointed out that people did stuff with that data that I actually started paying a little bit more attention uh, to be accurate. Um, And there are some other things too, like, um, for example, blood pressure cuffs notoriously underestimate blood pressure at very low blood pressures and can overestimate it at very high blood pressures or underestimate it at very high blood pressures. I think there's some other things. But what I think it does is it does um, present uh, equipoise for examining this further. Would you agree, gentlemen? I, I would. And as when we're discussing sort of the limitations of the data set, one of the things as somebody who does a lot of research with large data sets, um, I think it's important for people who don't do this type of work to understand data is Latin for dirty. All, there is no such thing as non-dirty data. Even in an RCT, you're getting dirty data. The only question is the degree of the dirt under your fingernails. Um, near is there is no such thing as perfect, but near is in the pragmatic world of data collection probably as good as you're going to get, despite the challenges of what you're saying, Mike. Because those are pragmatic challenges. That's the real world of real data. Is it's dirty? Yeah, and we have to, I agree. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think the other, you know, it's so hard to study this stuff too. One of the challenges we've looked at is, you know, every patient has, you know, certainly has different comorbidities, different uh, level of uh, reserve, right? Uh, Cardiac reserve, respiratory reserve, how much have they bled? How septic are they? What's their starting blood pressure? It's very hard to, 
generalize across the board with all these sick patients, you know, that a dose of this may work better in this patient versus that patient or, or not, you know, this dose, not weight based, but a standard dose. So, you know, that's one of the challenges, you know, I think that we've been facing is how do you find that clean data that Jeff's alluding to, you know, that really says, hey, we're finding something here. I think we need to publish this. How do we, pub- how do we harness that data that, that's clean? And that's a challenge. You know, I think, I think based upon our practice, harder. the field's even harder. <laughs> it, it is. Let me use that to go back to some of the prior work on atomidate versus ketamine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that mm-hmm. this paper, by the way, was not an atomidate versus ketamine, but there are plenty of those papers out there. And the challenge you get into, there was a paper that came out that said, oh my God, ketamine is associated with way more hypotension than atomidate. See, this proves that we're all smoking crack because we thought ketamine was more hemodynamically stable than atomidate, which we thought was hemodynamically stable. Well, the challenge is that there is a general, generally held belief that ketamine probably is more stable than atomidate, regardless of the amount of support for that. So when you're looking at just what drug people used, the patients with more hypotension were more likely to get ketamine. They weren't hypotensive because they got, or at least we don't know if they were hypotensive because they got the ketamine. They got the ketamine because they are hypotensive. And this is the challenge with retrospective research is trying to figure out the direction of association. It's the the classic thing that we always deal with in the ER where a patient comes in with hypertension and a headache, and they are absolutely convinced that the hypertension is causing the headache. When, in fact, there's an association, but the direction of causality is very fuzzy. It may very well be that the headache is causing the hypertension. So that that direction of causality, um, you just can't tell in observational work. Agree. And I think to get one other thing I just wanted to add and throw in there are, is there, again, granted, uh, observational and retrospective, but there are a couple of papers in the pre hospital literature that look at, for example, ketamine induction dose and uh, association with hypotension, uh, basically looking at shock index greater or less than like 0.9 in some of those patients and a couple other studies. So I think we have. Uh, I think we can all agree there's a paucity of data in this Mm -hmm. area, and we definitely uh, need to look at it. Um, But moving along to, you know, we talked about some of the hemodynamics. We talked about uh, the data that does and does not mostly exist uh, in this area. But let's talk about, like, the extremes of airway management, defining uh, crash airway in particular, and... um, uh, and management of those patients. So uh, at least according to a couple different sources, which seem to agree, the general definition of crash airway, at least in the pre-hospital emergency medicine literature, refers to patients that are essentially in arrest or peri-arrest, deep coma or, quote, near death, which I think is hard to define, but we kind of know it when you see it. Um, you cannot ventilate and cannot oxygenate. Um, how would, do you gentlemen have any addendums to that definition? I, I do. Um, but mine is a way more pragmatic research based, um, uh, caveat. I'm interested in hearing what, uh, Chris's thoughts about this are. Um, yeah, this is, it's kind of interesting because we, we talk about this quite a bit and I'd say we talk about it more in the, in the pre-hospital world than we do in the, uh, in the hospital world, but, um, you know, I always, medics always ask and, and flight crews tend to, they ask this a lot too, you know, it's like if my patient is completely unresponsive, but has a perfectly normal end title and their SpO2 is reasonable and they're oxygenating and ventilating and I've got X, you know, minutes of flight time I've got to deal with, or, you know, the transport's going to be this long or what have you, should I take that airway? And again, this, you could argue this all day long. Uh, you know, if they're a full, if they're, what if they're going to, you know, if they start getting nauseated or they start throwing up and, you know, I know you guys have been in the same boat before, but that's also, you know, something that that's worth at least mentioning other than the true crash airway where you're not oxygenating appropriately, you're not ventilating your semi to near unconsciousness or what have your peri arrest. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. 
Yeah, I think that it's odd because I actually had, we did a case review up here in Fort Worth today on a case that went, you were facing a decision, do I take the airway, do I not? And at the time, both of those seemed reasonable, both had pros, both had cons. The fact that we were doing a case review kind of tells you which way it went. Um, they decided to take the airway. They ended up, it didn't go well. Um, they didn't do it perfectly, but I'm, they ad- adapted rapidly like I would expect. But the um, question obviously is, well, it didn't go well. Therefore, the decision was wrong. It must have been wrong. Mm-hmm. You need to go yell at them and tell them don't ever do that again. And I'm like, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, As a paramedic, I got yelled at a lot for decisions I made based on the outcome, which is knowing information that was not available to me at the time I had to make the decision. So I go out of my way not to second guess people's decision making. Now, there are some cases where the information you had available said you should not have done what you did. But that's different than you should have known what was going, what the ultimate outcome is, and then changed your behavior. We don't have the ability to do that as humans. So I really try not to second guess decisions where you truly are at equipoise. The the big question you're talking about, they're oxygenating, ventilating well, but oxygenation and ventilation are not the only two reasons we take an airway. We also take an airway because of the potential for respiratory failure, the potential for loss of airway. Um, and especially if you're in a small aircraft, and most are compared to where you're dealing with patients in ERs, you and you, it's not like you can just pull over and stop. Um, so you have to worry not about what's going on here, but what about what is going to happen in the future and how likely it is. All of which is to say it's a tough decision, and I try to give people the grace that we all have to make decisions And sometimes they turn out to be the right thing. Sometimes they don't. So I I try to give people space to actually make decisions. The the caveat that I wanted to bring up around crash airways is I think frequently a crash airway is defined after the fact based on information that you know happened. For example, in the near registry, they define the person doing the intubation defined whether it was a crash airway or not, and they did it after the fact. And would you believe that there is an association between crash airways and not physiologically optimizing your patient? Yes, I get that. (laughs) But which way did that arrow go? I have a tendency to think that in the majority of cases, the person doing the airway just did not have the patience or confidence to stick with the steps that are needed to optimize the physiology. And they just did it. Hey, I'm in a hurry. And they just did it. And bad things happen. And therefore, by definition, it was a crash airway Mm -hmm. where if you had paused, taken some more time, optimized the physiology, perhaps it might not have been a crash airway. In defined by bad things happening. So we really don't know. I think the only way to truly know if something is a crash airway or not is have somebody recording, okay, you're about to push drugs. Do you think you have time to optimize the physiology or not? Yes or no. Um, and then see what the response is. So there's a real challenge with the definition of crash. Peri-intubation, I would argue, Okay, that's probably a crash airway, but there is a lot more that gets put into that bucket after the fact because of what the outcome was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I agree. Skip, I think the term. that's uh, let's let's take the the extension of that. Let's start to get kind of granular here with um, with some of these patients. So let's say you do scenario right. You have a hemodynamically compromised uh, trauma patient that was involved in a pedestrian versus uh, motor vehicle with um, possible uh, pelvic and intra-abdominal injuries that you think is bleeding internally. And um, they are, you know, a generous, generous GCS of six with deep stimulation. 
Maybe. It was a generous GCS. Best, right? But for the most it's part, soft. they're not really doing anything. Uh, and the, the crew on team would say, we're, we'll stick to our, our, our air medical teams, right? Um, the initial EMS crew on team is able to effectively BVM, two-handed, Jeff, two-handed, um, air, with uh, like a good it. suctioning. Like <laughs> yeah, with good suctioning and uh, a nasal trumpet in place. And the question being, and this has come up, you're maybe a five to 10 minute flight from the trauma center. Do you manage that airway? Or if you're effectively able to bag them, to, to ventilate and oxygenate them, uh, and, but they need other resuscitation, specifically blood products and whatnot, um, should that patient, even though they're a generous six, but mostly unresponsive, be intubated on scene, in flight, or perhaps not at all? Chris. That's Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And I agree with Jeff. I think this is where it gets back to uh, crew uh, experience, their confidence, their abilities, with, you know, with their limitations they think might be. Uh, and clinical judgment. And we spend a lot of time <clears throat> here, uh, down here in our shop, talking about um, clinical decision making, you know, you know, taking all the information that you have, and us trusting those crews, especially the flight crews, because they're highly trained. They most the overwhelming majority of the time, they're making what we feel is the right decision at the time based on the knowledge that they have, because we're not there. We're not there with them to help them make these decisions. So we rely on them to make the best clinical judgment possible. Um, and again, I think to answer your question, there is no good answer, right? Because they are perfectly capable of taking the airway in flight, even though that's not ideal, but they are perfectly capable of rolling the dice on some of these patients and deciding not to take the airway and getting them out of there off the scene and to the trauma center in five to 10 minutes where there's more resources while they're resuscitating en route. I don't think that's a wrong answer. Um, however, if it's a crew that's kind of got that gut feeling that, yeah, I don't want to do this in flight. It looks like they're deteriorating. They're getting more and more unresponsive. I think we should do it here. Then I would totally back that up. So I think it's really hard. There's no right answer, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, well, I agree 100% on the there is no right answer. And I really try hard not to pretend like there is. I think that I think we have to acknowledge that pre-hospital airway management is different fundamentally than in-hospital airway management. Um, when we are in the in the field, we're going somewhere, and that somewhere is much bigger, much better lit. The temperature is controlled, and you have a lot more people, and you have more experts. To the to some extent, I am in that situation in the emergency department. Also, in that I have a, additional help I can call in if I find myself in trouble. But it really is it's an assessment of risk versus potential reward. So, I think that if you are going to be, if you think you're going to hold off on taking an airway because you think your judgment, given all the evidence is that the patient will continue to oxygenate and ventilate well. They'll continue to protect their airway in route. And let's take your scenario a little bit further because I think the involvement of your brain really matters. So if the patient has a TBI and is hypotensive, let's say they have multiple injuries, we know what the consequences of hypotension and hypoxia are for TBI patients. We also know if they're hypotensive because they ain't got no blood, they need blood. And you may or may not have that blood, or you may or may not have time to fill up the tank with blood if you have it. So my argument for that is if you determine that they are likely to maintain their airway, I have no problem giving it a shot. Um, and I guess the, the key thing here is if you're in route, you're up in the air and then determine, well, shit, I was wrong. Now I have to take the airway. That situation, I think, is optimal for dropping a superglottic. I don't think in the majority of circumstances that you should intubate that patient. We know intubation takes longer. We know the success rate is lower 
and we know superglottics work, particularly temporarily. So in that situation, I would say absolutely drop a superglottic, get them to some place where you are now in a better lit environment, have more resources, and then you have better pre the patient, better prepared them for ultimate tube exchange, which may or may not be easier than the initial, initial intubation. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So this podcast was initially intended to be one episode, but man, we really once again went deep down a rabbit hole talking about a lot of these topics. We decided to split it into two parts. And this last part, part or this one we just recorded, part one, um, we basically, to summarize it, we talked about um, some key features that we're talking about and about key concerns when it comes to crash airways, or sp- specifically airway management in a profoundly hemodynamically unstable patient. We talked about things like our main concern. The whole point of uh, medication-facilitated intubation is to optimize our conditions, and one of those medications we give is a sedative agent to make people forget. We really want the amnestic properties primarily for that agent so they don't remember a procedure or being paralyzed or anything like that. But we're balancing that against their hemodynamics because we know that some and in fact, almost all agents, when someone's profoundly and hemodynamically unstable, um, can in fact lower someone's blood pressure and blunt their compensatory response under these situations. We went on to talk about what do we actually mean when we say crash airway. And furthermore, we went to talking about some of the complexities of decision making around intubating these patients. Do we do it on scene? Do we do it en route? Do we do it not at all? The decision making sometimes is so nuanced and complex. So we kind of talked through several scenarios and situations there. And then we got into the the classic mantra or the, I should say, contemporary mantra of resuscitate before intubate. What does that actually mean? What are we, what are we doing for these patients? And specifically, we always say that, but what are our goals? What do we have to actually get to in terms of their oxygen saturation and their hemodynamic goals before we go ahead and push those uh, medications? So that was part one. Please join us and stay tuned for part two. We're going to talk about things like pressors in these patients, specifically in these uh, hemodynamically unstable trauma patients. We talk about ventilating these patients before and after, both using a BVM and specifically mechanical ventilatory parameters. Um, We go on to talk more in depth about paralytics and some very, very controversial topics in the pre-hospital emergency medicine and critical care world about potentially uh, in select patients that are profoundly hemodynamically unstable and also completely unresponsive, uh, not using sedative agents because they may not remember at all and just using paralytics. Again, very, very controversial. So uh, I invite people to remain open-minded to that conversation. And also some other pieces about the paralytic puzzle in terms of the kinetics of some of those medications, how they work, and why it is so, so important to get optimal into debating conditions for a medication like rocuronium to actually wait the full 60 seconds. So uh, much more to come on some of that stuff. Please stay tuned and join us for part two of Crash and Burn on managing the managing airways in humanity unstable patients. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education. 